So now that you have seen that it is possible to do, we can, if we apply the same concept uh, to uh, uh, complementary uh, community currency. And uh, we did this with the Sardex. And uh, let's, let's look first uh, how the network of Sardex looks like. So this is a picture, uh, a graph of uh, Sardex business to business uh, transaction network. Um, it looks like a small world uh, random network. So this is a category of networks that kind of uh, defy attempts uh, to show their structure. So it, it's very chaotic uh, in, in the nature. So the colors of the nodes uh, depict the industry. So you see uh, that uh, companies from the same industry can be found all over. So there is no, no, uh, no order. And the network is uh, relatively big. So we have uh, 3,199 firms uh, and a huge number of transactions. And also the volume of transactions is, is relatively, relatively big. So uh, we, we went to analyze this a bit further. So if you try to, to see some structure in this, uh, what we did here is uh, we just uh, we just joined the, the nodes that are close together and and are uh, representing the same industry into a one bigger node. And uh, so you can see you have a lot of uh, cooperation in the services industry, which is the big red uh, node. Uh, you have a lot of cooperation in in retail pink note, uh, you have a cooperation in hospitality and a bit less in the manufacturing and uh, in the construction. Uh, what is interesting is that we have a category that is uh, blue. Uh, it is a wholesale. And you see that wholesalers don't deal directly with one another. So uh, they don't appear as a big, as a big uh, note. So, but this uh, this uh, analysis uh, gives you just uh, an idea that there must be cycles because here you can clearly see that uh, there are some uh, there are some cycles between between the industries. Okay? If we look at this uh, network uh, on a little bit more dynamic way, so we have here. Um, this network uh, represented as a basically it's uh, it's a big mess so nothing to be seen but it's you you get a sense uh, of, of how it looks like because it is shown in, in three, dim three dimensions and uh, what i'm doing now with this is uh, i will i will transform this into a spanning tree so the spanning tree means uh, that all the unnecessary, let's call them unnecessary uh, connections are removed. Uh, so uh, only those remain that the structure is still connected. And uh, what you can see here is uh, the kind of sense uh, of, of the radius of this, uh, of this uh, network. So how, how far it is to reach any node. And you see this, uh, uh, spikes or the branches here, uh, they are approximately four steps to reach. Uh, in average, in four steps, you can reach uh, any node. So th this means that the network is uh, really dense and everyone is very close uh, to one another. Then uh, now I will show you something else. So we are putting back all the connections and now we have a different type of spanning tree so this this is now uh, going uh, into depth and the whole network is now transformed transformed into a string you see this uh, that basically everyone every company in in, in this sardex network is part of of the string and this means that every connection on this string uh, 
is felt throughout the whole network because if you break this if you break one connection here in the middle uh, you are breaking you are you are influencing the, the whole network basically and this is just to demonstrate um, how many cycles there are you can imagine there are many cycles now uh, uh, we are back from the string view to all uh, all the edges are back and now you see that we are suddenly in the forest of, of uh, all, all the connections so the chaos in this system is big and the making order uh, in, in this system is a, is a challenge um, one thing that can be said about this uh, the, the little movie that you saw uh, it was produced uh, with the software that is used to to observe biological systems so uh, what you have seen could be uh, DNA, it could be protein reactions in, in yeast. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, similarity to life in these uh, random networks. Okay, so what can we do with this complexity? So the next step, what we do, we tested how the monthly multilateral set of uh, can perform in, in the SARDEX uh, network. So what you see now is uh, not the whole network, but this is a slice. It's just a month of May. And it is shown flat for the purpose. So the, the force, uh, force field energy was used to do this. Um, in, this um, in this way, uh, the algorithm tries to place the nodes in such a way that the, the edges have approximately the same length. And uh, this way you, you see with these shadows where there are more connections, there is more gray. Where there are less connections, there is more white. And you see that uh, the network is pretty dense. And, uh, you see something in the center. So what we did then, we found all the cycles. So we used our algorithm, our Tetris algorithm, to find all the cycles, and we got this. And I can move a little bit back and forth, so you can see that uh, a large portion of connections in the middle remains. What you see in color, are, uh, this is just depiction of uh, selected uh, cycles. So we have uh, in pink down there a very small cycle uh, with uh, three companies only. But the more interesting cycles are those depicted in blue and red. So these are uh, typical larger cycle. And they are also of a, of a typical length, around eight steps. And uh, here in the green, we can call these bridges. But actually, if you go, uh, if you follow the green, you see that the green steps into the red. And then if you follow the red uh, arrows, you will come uh, again to the to the green and and from and you, you can follow the green to go to the blue and close the cycle again. So basically you have one larger green cycle. And this goes on and on and on, as you have seen in the, in the movie, uh, where all the, all, uh, where the network forms a huge uh, string. So the, the, the largest cycles are very long and cycles are imposed one on, a, one on top of the other. So this is why we don't, I don't like to call them cycles, but I, I refer to this as a cyclic structure because it has uh, the same properties as a cycle. So if you remove the cyclic structure, you have, uh, you have saved the piggy bank yeah? and um, you have removed the risk out, out of the system because the, when you remove the cyclic structure, uh, what remains is uh, uh, is an acyclic graph that is uh, there is much less risk in the graph uh, that is acyclic. So this is basically the the effect of of this. So we can look now at this in numbers. 
So the table is uh, a bit uh, complex. I will give you some time to orient. So what we have on the left is what comes in. It's input, so in goes the invoices. Each invoice has a debtor and creditor and, and some values, of course. Uh, and then on the right, you have uh, the output. So the first thing uh, that our system does is uh, searches for the connected invoices. Uh, you might notice that connected invoices uh, number here is, uh, or the volume is the same as the total invoices. This is because uh, Sardex network is very, very dense. So it's a very dense community. Uh, in Slovenia, in normal monthly run, you, you don't get this situation. Approximately uh, half of uh, the volume goes out as not connected. So the next column is the compensated amount. This is the weight of the cyclic structure. Okay, so how much money is, or how much debt, or how much promises, doesn't mean how you call them, is tied in a cyclic structure. And here you have also in percent. Then, of course, uh, there is a reminder. So uh, when you take out the, uh, the cyclic structure, you, you have some uh, remaining debt. And what is interesting with this remaining debt is that uh, the liquidity required to, to clear is lower than the remaining debt. This is because uh, you, you still have uh, chains in this uh, network and one unit clears uh, more than one unit. Of, one unit of liquidity clears more than one unit of debt in such a network. So, and this number is, we, we call it net internal debt. So now let's look uh, at this uh, in even more detail. So here we have um, a graph of uh, net, net positions. So this basically shows the distribution of liquidity required among the firms. So those uh, who have a very positive net positions are uh, positioned on the left, and then those with the worst net positions are on the right. And uh, you get uh, this curve, the blue curve of net positions. Uh, in the light gray, you have uh, the credit position, and uh, in the light red, you have the debt position. It is interesting to observe that uh, there is, uh, you, you can see that here in the middle of the graph, where the net position is near zero, you still have a huge uh, spikes in uh, credit and debit positions. That means there is a lot of uh, trading going on within, within the group uh, on, on the edges, uh, on the left and the, on the right. Again, you have a huge spikes, but the net position is, is relatively bad. So basically you have importers and exporters. You can imagine this uh, like this. And this, this uh, left and right extreme positions, they have to be managed. So everyone who, who tried to, to manage uh, a system had some kind of experience uh, with this. Um, so this, uh, this can be managed internally, like um, you have some business advisors and they, they find new opportunities within the community to, to trade. And uh, the other thing is uh, you, you, can, you can do this externally, so with uh, import-export, or you can do this administratively, like uh, you use uh, Demurash or Writos or, or whatever. So there are many ways how to how to handle this, uh, and we didn't go into into this into this area. But um, uh, one important thing to note here: uh, so the sum of all negative net positions uh, equals uh, 
net internal debt. But what is interesting is that the sum of all positive positions also equals net internal debt. So basically, uh, for any this is a property of the obligation network. And uh, any obligation network, the most natural solution is the mutual credit, because this is how mutual credit is, is uh, defined. And uh, Sardex is very well positioned to, to, to serve this, because it is based on the mutual credit anyway. So on the next slide, uh, we have now the effects of, uh, of uh, reducing the indebtedness. So we have removed the cyclic structure, and then the remaining uh, credit uh, and the re remaining debt is obviously lower, and it, it, it is depicted in dark green and dark red. But uh, I would like to remind you that the net position remained the same. Meaning the, the, the need for external liquidity sources to clear the depths in the obligation network after removal of cyclic st structure is exactly the same. Uh, uh, what changes is in the remaining structure, there is no gridlock situations. This is so risk is much lower. And no one had to break the piggy bank. This is the liquidity saving uh, situation. OK, after this, we went on to, to see what happens if you now provide liquidity to this obligation network. And uh, here we will have to use some mathematics to explain. So uh, you can imagine the obligation network as, as a cloud. So okay, there and this cloud has a property. Uh, the, the property is a, a net positions vector, and net positions vector here is depicted by letter P. And providing finance. So uh, as we did in the small example, so we have a special node, uh, a liquidity node. And uh, this liquidity node uh, can be described again with the financing vector F. So this is kind of uh, basic for the mathematics uh, that we used. And uh, if you want to clear all, all, all the depth that is there in the obligation network, then uh, the sum of uh, vector P and F has to be zero. So you have to provide uh, the exact amount uh, to every company so that they can clear all, all the debts. And then this is the, the basic mathematical principle behind it. So to put it into practice, uh, you have to expand it a little bit. So um, here we have a, a payment system uh, as, uh, and this setup was used to analyze the Sardex situation. So the liquidity source uh, is divided in, in four um, special nodes to depict uh, the special situations. So if I start from the left, uh, we have a node uh, that, that, that depicts the, the holdings that companies have in complementary uh, currency. So this is basically representing the positive values in the mutual credit uh, system. Uh, the next note uh, is a potential for new credit. So how much, how much the, the company can go into minus. Uh, then the third one is uh, repayment of this negative uh, amount. And the last one is uh, topping up. Uh, so you, you, you build up your positive value on your account in the mutual credit system. But this model can be applied for anything. So it, it could be micro crediting, peer to peer, uh, network, whatever. So, or we could even build a, a system with uh, which is more detailed. So with, with more with more nodes. Uh, what is important is that you follow the the basic principles. So you you you, try, you are trying to match the financing uh, vector with the net positions. 
So using this mathematical model, uh, we, we got these results. So this is, uh, again, this is just for uh, the month of May. And this represents just the successful uh, uh, cleared debt. So it's not the whole network, but just uh, what was cleared. So you see these four special nodes uh, that I described on the slide earlier. So they appear here in the same order. So we have a blue node on the left that is supplying the, the positive liquidity on, from the from the complementary currency. Uh, we have the red node that is uh, giving new new credit. So basically, companies are going into minus in in the mutual credit. Then we have uh, credit uh, repayments, and uh, the last one is topping up the uh, the, the values. So uh, there, there are some special notes uh, represented here in green color. So these notes are special because it turns out that there are a lot of companies that do not need any external source of liquidity to clear their, their debts. So, um, and uh, this is an interesting uh, situation. So not everyone really needs money. They can they can pay with uh, with promises. So it, it's a strong uh, concept. Uh, bottom left, you have a small um, table that depicts uh, this this situation in more detail. So basically, any firm can be in any of this situation. They can have either positive or negative net position in the obligation network, or they can have a positive or negative CC balance uh, in the mutual credit uh, system. And uh, depending on their state, they either receive or they store uh, some, some value in, in, the, in the liquidity source. If we look this into even more detail, I would like to point out uh, here we see, uh, for example, these uh, green pairs. This is basically uh, a bilateral uh, set off. And uh, below you can see you have uh, green dots that do not require, but they still receive funds from the liquidity source, but indirectly. So the, you, you see, for example, a red, uh, a red node is connected to the green one. So, and you have a lot of these uh, these combinations in this network. If we look here at how the liquidity is going out of the network, you see at, uh, at the repayment of the negative values is uh, mostly green. So that means. That if you if you want to repay your debt, you have to create new opportunities uh, in in the network. So you cannot repay your debt if you didn't do any any business. If you don't have a, a positive net position in in the obligation network, the green line, the red lines uh, here, uh, along with the green, this this you can interpret this as a reprogramming of of your debt. And uh, it's interesting with this system that this happens automatically. The, the blue note uh, far left, you see all co colors coming in. So basically uh, the, the companies that have a positive uh, net position in the obligation network uh, receive funds from all kinds of sources and they are funneled back into the, into the account. So uh, the, the the source of the, the, the source of topping up uh, is coming from everywhere. Okay, what does it mean for the system as a whole? We see here uh, now um, the, the graph that shows uh, monthly results of this process. So before we were looking just at the, at the month of May. Here we see uh, all months in the year. So the first month is a bit special because uh, we started with 
zero on all accounts. And this is why uh, in January, it looks like uh, mutual credit that is depicted with the green line uh, was most effective. This is because uh, there was a lot of credit available. Uh, on the February, you have a different uh, situation because uh, ha half of the companies had a minus uh, value on their mutual credit account. So there was not so much uh, liquidity available from uh, from the mutual credit as a source. And uh, then you, you can see that uh, obligation clearing, so the our Tetris method uh, of finding the, the, the maximum cyclic structure uh, performs slightly better than, uh, than, than the mutual credit. But still, uh, in this setup, uh, the green and red lines uh, are very, very comparable. Um, this is uh, slightly, it, it, it is by chance, but it also shows um, uh, that uh, the different, different solutions in similar situation uh, give similar results. Um, what is interesting is that, uh, that uh, the results, when you combine both methods, so mutual credit and uh, obligations clearing uh, with our Tetris algorithm, you, you get uh, the best result. It's the way we did it. I think it, it, it would be the best way for any community to, to do it because uh, we didn't uh, just find the cyclic structure, extract it and then uh, forget about it. Uh, what we did is uh, we, we went for uh, we, we went to find all, all possible and maximum flows in this, in this uh, network so to, to deliver the maximum result. We didn't uh, leave any chance for companies to decide for themselves what to pay and what not. Okay, coming uh, to the conclusions of our uh, article. So we, we started with the discussion. And here in the discussion section, we tried to compare uh, our results and, uh, and uh, what we know uh, otherwise. So we try to compare different uh, uh, concepts like fiat money, obligation clearing, mutual credit. And uh, this comparison is, uh, okay. To me, it's a bit, uh, it, is, it is definitely a matter of debate. So uh, fiat and mutual credit are like uh, apples and pears and obligation clearing is like a spaghetti, I think. It's really not a fruit. And uh, the, whole, the whole reason for this is because um, economy as such, I think moved from the idea that, that money is a thing. So we are not thinking about coins, but the whole economy is looking at, uh, at money as, as, uh, through the balance sheets. So the problem with the balance sheets is that the balance sheets are, are actually uh, a slices in time. And nobody knows what happens between one and the other slice. So uh, you are basically uh, re researching uh, economy in the dark. So what we do with uh, obligations clearing, with the Tetris, we are observing flows and we, we observe every, every flow in detail. So that's why this is a spaghetti because uh, the flows are very uh, complex, uh, mixed, and uh, the results are, are therefore, uh, so the comparison, I think it's, it's necessary uh, for, for some kind of understanding and explanation, but uh, I don't know how relevant it is. Uh, especially the last line, the velocity of circulation is problematic. Mm. problematic. So uh, every complementary currency goes out with the marketing message. Yes, uh, the circulation in a mutual credit is much faster than in fiat. But this is questionable, okay? Because here the fiat usually says uh, the circle, the, the speed of circulation is one. But this is this is not 
true. This is the this is the um, income velocity. So this is the GDP versus the monetary mass. And in the mutual credit, you usually look at all the debt clear versus the mutual credit issued. And this is not the same thing. And with the obligation clearing, what is the speed? So I, I would say it is the speed of light. So basically this is the top, top speed possible. Okay. Anyway, a lot of things to discuss. I would just like to point out to one thing. We started with late payment as a pressing problem. And then we build up to, to huge uh, real-time gross settlement systems that turn incredible amounts of money. And we figured out there are, there are cycles. Then we found cycles in a Sardex network that is relatively big. But this picture now, this is cycles in Sarafu community. So Sarafu community is a universal basic income project in Kenya. And transactions here are really, really, really slow. So the, the, as far as I understand, the, the users of this system receive like 400 Sarafos, and this, this would be less than four US dollars, and they trade. And what you can see from this graph that even small trades in the villages where, where people buy basic stuff, food, uh, transportation, uh, energy, uh, education, even here you have cycles because this is not picture of all transactions. This is this is picture of a cyclic structure within Sarafu network. And you can see in colors, there are communities. And actually in Sarafu, the communities use different, uh, different monetary units. So there are different types of, uh, of tokens. It's not uh, one token alone. And you see that there are, there are trades among the communities. And I would say that this is just a message that uh, we have to be brave and we have to embrace this fact and, and go uh, and try to establish uh, the infrastructure that will enable communities to trade and uh, to go away from the banking structure that is basically the banking payment system is, is uh, drawing the blood out, out of us. And uh, the Sarafu network, I think, is a proof that a parallel system is, is feasible. And I would like to, to build on this and I plan to, to, to study it further. So at the end, uh, this kind of work doesn't come in, in isolation. I would uh, like to thank uh, especially to Rudy Britz and Tomas Shara, they are the inventors of this system that is running in, uh, in Slovenia. Uh, at least Rudy is present, Tomas maybe too. And uh, the publishing of this paper was financed by Moneta and uh, the Erasmus University. And here I have to give really special thanks to Georgina. So I never met her, but she, she was a great support uh, in publishing and also in advertising our work. So great thanks to, to everyone. So, and now we are moving to questions and answers. So I don't know how long I was, too long, for example. <laughs> Thank you very much for a very, very interesting and very clear talk, Tomas. I see there have been a lot of very, very good questions in the chat um, and also a lot of good discussion. So some of them have already been answered. Uh, so I'm going to move straight to a question from John Hennigan, uh, which came in around the slides on cycle removal in the Sardex network. Uh, and he was wondering, is there an optimum or minimum number of participants or transactions or values for a, a cyclic system like this to work? Yeah, uh, I didn't uh, research this, but uh, I, I have done a lot of experiments on various, uh, from various sources and from, from the practice. Uh, the effects kick in uh, when you cross around 1,000 uh, participants. 
and uh, you are looking for an average of five transactions per, per participants. So with this kind of density, you, you start getting good results. With lower density, of course, you can get uh, nice cyclic structures, but uh, it's not, uh, not necessary. The effect might not be so good. So we have tried, uh, so the biggest structure that uh, we, I had the pleasure to, to study uh, contained uh, 32 million transactions. And uh, the, the success in such a big structure is that the cyclic structure, the weight of cyclic structure is over 60% of, of the value. It was a very dense, very dense uh, structure. Yeah. But the practicalities start uh, very well. So, for example, uh, Sardex is already more than big enough. It could be smaller. And, for example, Serafo network was a surprise for me. Very nice cycling structure. Um, and we've just had a comment on the chat from Hans Florian saying that optimum density also depends on the diversity of the participants, which I'm sure is true as well. Uh, uh, the yes, from the, I can comment this shortly. Uh, what is important uh, uh, is that you have uh, participants from various industries. So we, we were uh, trying this on, on, on data from accounting service, for example, or from a bank. And it turns out if you have uh, participants of one bank, it's not good. It's already too narrow. Or if you have a participants from one accounting service, it's too narrow. So you need... You need a mix of, uh, it's very important that you have services uh, in the mix and uh, you have, you need trade. Trade, services, manufacturing, this is the key. If you miss one industry, you will not get a lot of cycles. Thanks. And um, uh, the, next, so the next question is from Charlie Davis, uh, who's asking about, again, mutual credit in the Sardex system, whether or not you evaluated the quality of the deficit or credit positions of the obligations uh, and if so, what metrics did you use for this analysis? And I'd, I'd also like to connect that to a comment from John Hennigan uh, about how it would be interesting to see a municipality as a node. Um, and I understand there's a concept of anchor inst institutions such as uh, local authorities or hospitals or universities. Um, and so perhaps you could comment, comment on that. Okay, for the purposes of this uh, article, we didn't uh, do this kind of uh, thing. So what we what we did, we applied the same rules that uh, are applied in, in Sardex. So basically, every every company received uh, two percent of their annual turnout uh, turnout as a credit limit. This is everything that we did. So uh, Paolo, I, I see Paolo there, maybe he can comment a little bit this question because he knows the Sardex much better than me. Please, Paolo, turn on your mic. Yes, <clears throat> hi. Uh, Tom, can you please uh, uh, repeat the first part of the question? Absolutely. Uh, yes, it's whether you evaluated the quality of the credit deficit or credit positions, uh, and if so, what metrics did you use to do so? Quality, what does that mean? Um, uh, I'm going to very, very quickly unmute um, Charlie so that he can specify exactly what he meant by quality. One second. You mean like a credit score? Yep, I, I imagine so. Okay, yeah. if it's a credit um, score, then then uh, Tomasha has, has already answered. So basically what, what we did is, um, as, as I think Jens also pointed out earlier in the chat, uh, of course, we do not have the data on euro payments from these companies in the Sardex network, because that's private data that they don't share with anybody and not even with Sardex. What we did was to uh, have, uh, we use the, the uh, data on Sardex transactions only, and we pretended that that was in euros. Okay, that's for the first simulation, we said, okay, let's, uh, let's assume that these are euros and let's see how much can be cleared. And, and you know, and that's explained uh, in, in the, well, Tomas uh, showed you the numbers for that. And then in the second simulation, we had to say, okay, let's pretend that the, these companies now have some uh, mutual credit system that's, uh, that they're re relying on as well. Uh, and, and so, as Tomas said, we, we, we apply the same rule that Sardex uses, 
of, of uh, annual turnover per company. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, you know, there was no attempt at uh, evaluating the, the, the credit score of that particular company. Uh, and uh, by doing that, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, all, you know the, all the, 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 the values and the, the amount of, of clearing uh, is, is shown in the paper, but it basically it doubles. It doubles the amount of, of clearing with just a little bit of liquidity, which is one of the most interesting, uh, I think, uh, uh, findings for, from my point of view of this analysis that you don't need much extra liquidity to have a big impact on how much on how much clearing you can achieve. Thank you very much for expanding on that, Paolo. And uh, Tomas has indicated that he's very kindly willing to extend the session by an extra 15 minutes. Uh, so we should have some more time to answer some questions. So I hope most of you can stay, but of course, if you can't, there is a recording which we will circulate up afterwards and Tomash will be answering any questions which are not answered in this ses session in writing on the Meetup Forum. Um, so we're going to have a couple more, I guess, fairly technical questions on the Sardex system. Then we're going to move on to some of the more, some of, some of the broader questions which have come up. Um, and so the first, the first one is, uh, how does the chosen time span influence the liquidity required? Uh, is it a month, or a week, or a day? And that is from Hans Florian. Um, yeah, yeah. So, that's the that's answer is very simple. The, the, the longer the time span, uh, the less uh, liquidity you need. So if you take a year, you get much denser networks because the number of participants is the same, but the number of uh, connections is uh, 12 times more. So for every month. So the denser the network and the, the for all the practical reasons, uh, I think the, the doing this every day in, in, a, in a small community doesn't make sense because uh, it doesn't uh, go well with the business cycle. The business cycles uh, are usually one month. So you, you get monthly salaries and uh, companies issue monthly bills. For example, utility bills are uh, once a month and things like that. Um, I think the the optimum number, the optimum system would probably be to do it uh, by quarters because um, doing it in three months would uh, make a much denser network and it would still not be a huge delay in, 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 in payments. But still what we aim for is uh, to, to, uh, to enable payments uh, in less than 30 days. So then you kind of forced to do this um, in 30 days. But what is, what is possible is you can put uh, unresolved from one month to another. If you cannot pay, it, it doesn't make sense uh, to, to take it out. So you leave whatever you cannot pay, you leave it in the system. And uh, this is also, this, this would increase the density and it would increase the, the success of this system. Thanks, I'm also going to very briefly abuse my position as chair of the Q&A and ask a follow-up question, which has just occurred to me, which is that uh, in the paper, you analyzed a line of mutual credit equal to only 2% of the turnover of the participating businesses. And you found that even this very small credit limit was enough to eliminate a very large fraction of the need for bank money to settle um, are you aware of how the proportion of bank money needed to settle changes as you increase the credit limit available to each business? Yeah, the, uh, the typical, so this, this is uh, uh, from, from observations of the different obligation networks. If uh, companies contribute approximately 20% of what they owe, you usually get over 99% of clearing, okay? It's uh, the, the most difficult part is the last 1%, but uh, if, if you have around 20% per, per company, that's typically you, you, you clear 99% of obligations. So um, th this is, this is uh, fr from the practic practical point of view. Yeah, no, that's that's quite an, quite astonishing, really. Um, so our next and final technical question is from Lian Usher, uh, who's asking: in a in a cyclic graph, uh, wouldn't this actually be more risky 
because because there's the potential for greater contagion um, could 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 it induce a depth spiral. Yeah. Okay, cyclic structures are uh, interesting because they uh, they have double properties. So if you look at them uh, from the risk perspective, uh, you are right. Cycles in the networks are a source of risk and source of contagion. Mm -hmm. But this is why it is important to remove them. But when you remove them, and if you remove them with uh, the multilateral set off, uh, which is what we do with, uh, with, with this system, uh, you are not just removing the risk, but you are also uh, providing uh, a liquidity savings. So no, no, one is, no one has to break the piggy bank to, to resolve the, um, uh, the, the risky situation. So this is, this is kind of a double, double property of, of a cycle. OK, yeah, thank you. Um, and I think there's a really interesting question here, which has come up from Alex Camper. Um, and one of the things I thought was really good about your paper was that it gave some historical background on the Slovenian system. But this is going you know, way, way, way back. So Alex's question um, is that payments on credit was widely used in commerce throughout history. Medieval fairs were specifically organized as clearing events. Uh, so should we not say that this is not really an innovation, but rather just a relearning, but with the application of modern technology? Yeah, yeah this is, uh, this is uh, Umberto Eco in uh, his quote is that every book is already written. Uh, I think the economics is, uh, is the same. So we, we use the same techniques and just use the new words. And uh, you are, you are uh, right. And uh, in the, this system is not uh, a communist system or a socialist system. This is a normal e economy uh, system. But the need to, to have a special solution was maybe a bit bigger because the, uh, the, the banking system in, in the socialist country was not so strong. And uh, the, need, the need to provide alternative solutions to companies was much bigger. So uh, I have a kind of a personal connection with this because my father was a chief information officer of, of the agency that provided this service. And, I asked him, hey, father, what, what, what was this? And he said, Tomas, without this, nothing would be paid. And this was the only answer he, he gave me. So it's, uh, it was out of the necessity, but it's, not, it, it's, an, it's an universal principle. And um, complementary currencies and, uh, and small schemes like Sarafu, uh, schemes that provide uh, local sources, uh, they, they need this, this system. We, we have to uh, learn again about the history and use the modern tools uh, to achieve these effects. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the next question, in fact, I'm going to combine two. Uh, one from Dill Green, which I'll read out in full, uh, asking whether it's necessary to consider imbalances within a network as problems, so to speak, or whether they could actually be taken as signals as to whether as to where the net positive should be invested, um, since this would in fact improve the effectiveness of the network for all members and even relocalize trade. And also uh, Jakob has asked um, or he, whether, uh, based on his understanding of the Sarafu network, um, part of that is investment into various community projects uh, and whether you've looked into models where investment would be part of the network. Uh, the problem with the obligation network is that this is a chaotic system. That means when you do uh, a change in the system, the outcomes can, can be surprised. So, uh, of course, uh, it is nice to see, oh, I have a network, I have net position, and now I will put a new relationship in, in it. And you, you go into this with all best intentions and uh, you can get a very surprising result. So, in the chaotic network, for example, you diminish one depth and you would say, okay, I diminished one depth. So now the, the net internal depth should be lower, but this is not necessarily true. It can be bigger. And, uh, and, and the same goes if you add uh, connections, you, you would say, okay, if I add more depth into the network, then uh, there should be a higher net internal depth, but it's not necessarily true. It can be lower. So uh, doing experiments uh, with this, uh, like playing God, uh, no, 
now I know I see everything and I put it's very it's very uh, dangerous. What I think is uh, we, it is possible to use this system to observe what is happening and to um, to design policies and practices that reduce these um, uh, unbalanced situations. But to use this system to go targeting exactly this, I think it's very dangerous because you might do more harm than, than good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I think that's uh, actually related to a follow-up comment Alex Camper has uh, made about um, centralization and decentralization. And so he's refer referencing the Sigo Sikoba system, which he's developing, uh, which I'm not personally familiar with. But he says, in this system, we do not use the mutual credit concept, as this requires some centralization. Uh, someone has to decide how much the liquidity provider allocates to each user. Rather, in their system, every user grants and manages credit lines given to other users. And so whilst users have more work to do and need to manage their risk, you maintain this, this decentralization. Um, so, so what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> My head is kind of empty. <laughs> um, do you want me to try and answer that? Uh, please, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, <clears throat> um, two things that what you describe so sounds like trust lines. Trust lines is a similar uh, bi binary bilateral mutual credit system uh, with which you can create chains um, and achieve something similar to the centralized solution, but it is more distributed. Um, uh, actually, Tomas has started to talk to me about the possibility of using some sort of uh, blockchain system to provide uh, some sort of interface uh, or uh, intermediate layer between the users uh, who would access it in a distributed way and some sort of control that could be centralized in the sense that there is a single algorithm or set of algorithms that, that somehow calculates uh, the, the credit lines. <clears throat> But yes, uh, indeed, the mutual credit system uh, uh, works a little bit like a central bank in the sense that uh, the credit lines setting is, is very similar to the function of a central bank in a in national economy. Um, and this has been an issue for, um, for me personally, because I'm interested in governance of com you know, community governance in general. And so how do we square the appeal of peer-to-peer -peer systems and this and decentralized the blockchains and so forth with uh, the, the centralized approach of uh, mutual credit and even more of uh, uh, obligation clearing. Uh, and <clears throat> I think that part of the answer might be uh, dividing, and I'm totally improvising here, but <clears throat> maybe dividing the problem into different layers so that some, uh, at some layers there is more centralization and at the level of, let's say, mutual accountability between the players and the actors, uh, which would be a more of a social layer, you can have a greater distribution and a, a better governance approach. Then there is also the, DA, the, the DAO approach and the, the, you know, the DAO perspective, but I, I don't know enough about it to, to get into it. Was that, sorry, that was a bit chaotic, but that's the best I can do. <laughs> no, for, for, thank you very much for jumping in there. Um, we've got, one more question. If I've missed your question, uh, please feel free to post it in the chat again. But we've got one more question from Matthew Slater uh, of the Credit Commons. Uh, does Tomash think that central bank digital currencies might decrease settlement times? Mm, I don't think that uh, this is really con connected. So the 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 use of uh, central bank uh, digital currencies is now, there is a big debate. Uh, wh what are they for? Uh, who should have it? Uh, what is the main purpose? Uh, and uh, the, the general idea is uh, to design the central bank uh, digital currency in such a way that it would help trading. So they will, the design of uh, CBDC uh, at least for the euro is, is such, so the ideas that are popping uh, out right now are such that uh, it will make no sense uh, to save, uh, to, to have a savings account in the central bank, but 
it would it would make uh, sense to to do a lot of transactions. Um, so in this sense, the central uh, if this succeeds, the, the the central bank digital currencies should uh, should help. But um, the speed the the velocity of circulation, the main obstacles uh, are are actually the gridlocks and. The central bank digital currency will do nothing to to remove because there will be no clearing. Although I, I did I wrote to to several forums and uh, and also we, uh, me and my colleagues uh, Rudy Britz and Tomas Shara we wrote uh, several letters to to institutions and people urging them not to forget the the centralized. Um, features uh, not to leave them just for for the banks and for the payment systems but uh, you can imagine the, the responses i think uh, the, they were all filed in in the circular things you know hops the basket so but uh, maybe we as a forum we, we can push forward that uh, some kind of uh, mutual a set of a multilateral set of is is necessary to increase the circulation more more talk about it uh, the the more chance that this will happen yeah. thanks okay i'm going to ask one final closing question which really kind of brings things back to um i guess the way the way this was introduced uh, around the circular economy and i was wondering whether you had seen any evidence even if it's just preliminary that the sardex network is in fact driving um the emergence of a circular econ economy from the bottom up I think uh, that uh, proving the existing uh, existence of circles is uh, basically a strong point for for the case of circular economy, and uh, communities like Sardex are definitely a good example. Um, and uh, using using um, multilateral set of in this uh, is is also is already practiced. So in Slovenia we have. Uh, one uh, social uh, cooperative called ETRI, and uh, they are in fight for money as any other social enterprise, and they use the, the, the multilateral set of uh, scheme in Slovenia to finance their business because they, they always have a, a potential to, to sell something or to buy something, but uh, and they connect. The connection happens uh, through the multilateral offset system in, in Slovenia. So uh, this is this is uh, basically already proven that uh, that uh, multilateral offsets, uh, uh, centralized multilateral offsets, helps small communities and social enterprises to achieve the circularity. And this. This A3 community is all about the, the circular economy. They do uh, super projects like uh, producing uh, uh, artificial leather from apple skins and things like that. So the, I, won't, I don't want to go into details, but uh, the, the whole idea of the cooperative is uh, to be in, very inclusive, uh, responsive to environment and things like that. And they use multilateral offset the central feature provided by country to help them run the business so the answer is yes 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 brilliant well, thank, thank you very much for answering that one so we're just coming up to time um so i would just like to thank all of you for a really fascinating and lively discussion um i think you know as the organizers we've been extremely gratified by the number of people and the general response to the event um we will be organizing ones in the future we can't say exactly when yet but we do intend to make this uh as you know as, as as and when as and when we feel like we've got um anything anywhere near as substantial as what tomash has just presented um to give to you again and of course you know do feel free to continue discussing in the meetup chat so i'd just like to thank our speaker tomash fleischman once again and wish you all a good evening and a good weekend take care Thanks everyone for, for coming. Thanks, Thanks. Tomash. Bye. Bye. And uh, we'll post the recording on the Meetup uh, platform. Okay. Um, Matt, can you? Uh, okay.